himmlischer Vater, wir wollen stille werden vor dir. Dear Father in heaven, we want to become silent before your presence. Wir bekennen dir, dass wir alle Sünder sind. We confess to you that we are all sinners. Wir brauchen Jesus und wir brauchen dich, himmlischer Vater. We need Jesus and we need you, dear heavenly Father. Gib uns deinen Heiligen Geist, dass wir das, was hier gesagt wird, auch verstehen. Please give us your Holy Spirit, that we may understand what is said here. Dass wir es in unseren Herzen tragen und weitergeben können. That we can have it in our hearts and that we can pass it on to others. Ich danke dir für die Zeit, die wir hier zusammen sein dürfen. Thank you for the privilege of being here together. Im Namen Jesu. Amen. In the name of Jesus, Amen. Didn't quite finish the time of the end presentation, but we're close. And uh, I want to at least look briefly at this quote on the screen. Um, all right. In the first sentence, it, it teaches a very important truth. It says, the prophecies present a succession of events leading down to the opening of the judgment. This is an important truth to uh, acknowledge in Bible prophecy. And let me give you an example in my mind why this is important. Uh, you know the statement where Sister Wright says that had all those that were involved in the sec second angel's message, had all the virgins, I forget exactly how she articulate, articulates it, but she said had they in carried on by faith in entering into the most holy place experience, we would be in heaven ere this. And that, that's a very bad paraphrase, but it's been a long day. But do you know that quote? I mean, that, that's the first one where Sister White says they could have went right on into heaven if, they'd, if the whole 50,000 had unitedly uh, followed each of the steps, the first, second, third angel's message in the most holy place. And then, of course, there was a, uh, a couple attempted revivals before 1888, but we know about 1888, if uh, that revival would have been accomplished, the Lord would have come. And we've seen, we've seen those quotes in the spirit of prophecy, and we know the quote uh, that we may have to be here for many more years because of our unbelief. And the point is this, the, someone will ask you, how is it uh, that uh, if uh, all the 50,000 Millerites had been faithful in the 1840 to 44 time period, how could have the Lord really came before this? How, how can we honestly tell the world that the United States at that time had the power to force the whole world to worship the beast of Catholicism? Isn't that uh, stretching the limits of uh, reasonability? A and from my mind, no. The Lord's in control of his providential history, and he, he states that it could have happened, so it could have happened. But to, we sometimes will take that approach and uh, insist, therefore, that uh, some of the things that are taking, here, taking significance here at the end of the world, um, they can't be a fulfillment of prophecy because there's no way they could have existed um, back in the immediate time past 1844. So, what, I, what I'm wanting to suggest to you is that inspiration tells us that the conclusion of prophecy, where they come to their, their meeting point, is at the judgment. And we know that in Daniel 7, the little horn goes into judgment. Daniel 8 takes us to the judgment, 1844. And rightly understood, Daniel 11 does the same. Because Daniel 11, verse 40, it comes to 1798, and if you've had time to look at this quote, Sister White is, is telling us that this is the time period of the judgment, 1798, it's the time of the end, 1844, it's this time period that the judgment entered in, and once we understand that verse 40 of Daniel 11 is this time of the end, we're realizing that that part of the book of Daniel 11, verses 1 through 40, have come up to the judgment. Now, verses, the verse 40 part B that was fulfilled in 1989 and verse 41 onward, that's part of the judgment too. It's the part of the judgment where Christ is bringing the judgment of the living to a conclusion under the Sunday law crisis. So 
those prophecies come down to the judgment. The judgment is the, the focal point of end time Bible prophecy and this is one, where, one place where Sister White um, teaches that. The prophecies present a succession of events leading down to the opening of the judgment. This is especially true of the book of Daniel. But that part of his prophecy which related to the last days Daniel was bidden to close up and seal to the time of the end, not till we reached this time could a message concerning the judgment be proclaimed based on the fulfillment of these prophecies. But at the time of the end, the prophet says the prophet, many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. Daniel 12, 4, not till after the great apostasy and the long period of the reign of the man of sin can we look for the advent of our Lord, the man of sin which is also styled the mystery of iniquity, the son of perdition, and that wicked represents the papacy, which as foretold in prophecy was to maintain its supremacy for 1260 years. This period ended in 1798. Hmm. Notice this. I mean, when you're, when you're doing Daniel 11, 40 to 45, and you have a short period of time with Seventh-day Adventists, and you come to verse 40 of Daniel 11, and you start at the time of the end, the easiest thing to do is to go to Great Controversy 356, where she says the time of the end is 1798, and then you've made your point, and you don't have to do an hour on, on the time of the end like we did in our last presentation. But if you want to establish it from the Bible, you spend the hour like we did in the last presentation. But in reality... In the book of Daniel, the time of the end is the end of a time prophecy, and sure enough, that's what Sister White says too, because she teaches that 1844 was the time of the end, and she teaches that 1798 was the time of the end. She's consistent with the book of Daniel. The time of the end is the end of a time prophecy. And in the passage that the time of the end is referred to, we need to determine the context so we can tell what time prophecy is under discussion to figure out what year is... Um, being identified. Students of prophecy came to the conclusion that the time of the end was at hand. In the book of Daniel they read, unto 2,300 2, days then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Thinking that the earth was the sanctuary, they understood that the cleansing foretold in Daniel 8, 14 represented the purification of the earth by fire at the second coming of Christ. Searching the scriptures for further light and comparing this prophetic period with the records of historians, they learned that the 2,300 days extended to the year 1844. The first and second angels' messages were given in 1843 and 1844. We are now under the proclamation of the third, but all three of the messages are still to be proclaimed. It is just as essential now as ever before that they shall be repeated to those who are seeking for truth by pen and voice. Voice we are to sound the proclamation, showing their order and the application of the prophecies that bring us to the third angel's message. There cannot be a third without a first and second. These messages we are to give to the world in publications and discourses showing in the line of prophetic history those things which have been and those things which will be. Brother Russell read this um, earlier this morning. Um, here, Sister White um, is saying that in 1843 and 1844 this, the first and second angels' messages were given. I think if you look closer um, at her writing, she will mark the, the point that the first angel's message arrives in history is 1840, and it was given in 1841, 1842, 1843. It was continued to be given. We're giving it today, but it arrived in history in 1840. But this quote here, selected messages, um, she has cited 1843. And I, this quote is always interesting to me because she's teaching that you and I are to... Continue to proclaim by pen and voice the applications of the prophecies that bring us to these messages that were given in 1843 and 1844. And what prophecy brings us to 1843? Daniel 12. Daniel 12. The 1335. We're to continue to present that. Just a point in passing when we're dealing with time prophecy. If we put the 1335 at the end of the world, that we, then we can't continue to proclaim the prophecies that bring us to 1843 as the pioneers continue to proclaim. Testimonies to Ministers, page 115. Daniel stood in his lot to bear his testimony, which was sealed until the time of the end when the first angel's message should be proclaimed to the world. And it, uh, I'm sure getting kind of foggy over the last few weeks, but I'm sure we're going to nail down from inspiration that the first angel's message is 1840. I think I have the quotes when we get to the, we're dealing with the trumpets. 1840 is the first angel's message, and Sister White is saying here that 1840 is the time of the end. What's the time of the end? By definition, what is the time of the end? An end of a time prophecy. 
Was there a time prophecy that came to an end in 1840? Yes, Ottoman Empire. Revelation 9.15. Evangelism 6.13. There are those who are searching the scriptures for proof that these messages are still in the future. They gather together the truthful mu- truthfulness of these messages, but they fail to give their their proper place in prophetic history. Therefore, such are in danger of misleading the people in regard to locating the messages. They do not see and understand what? What don't they understand? The time of the end, or when to locate the messages. The time of the end has to do of where we locate the fulfillment of a time prophecy. And to not understand that. Um, Okay, We're still on verse 40, at the time of the end, 1798. We've established that from the book of Daniel and put a second testimony on it. With the spirit of prophecy shall the king of the south, atheistic France, push at him. Um, Daniel 8, 4, I saw the ram pushing. This is the same Hebrew word that's translated as push in verse 40. And uh, it's defined as to war against. At the time of the end, 1798, shall the king of the south begin a war against the king of the north. And uh, here's more um, identification that the deadly wound was given in 1798. 1798, atheistic France began a war with the papacy. Later, later the papacy shall retaliate against atheism. Its retaliation will be like a whirlwind with chariots, horsemen, and many ships, and the papacy will then enter into the countries of atheism and overflow and pass over. King of the North, part three, three geographical obstacles. Brother was talking to me last night about, or this morning, well, about something that we said last night. I'll tell you what we said last night so you can understand the context of what he was saying this morning. This requires a little bit of discussion, though, outside of the scope of what we're doing, but we'll take it up at this point. I'm not talking about the Alpha and Omega of apostasy here. I'm not talking about that. But I do believe that the Alpha and Omega of apostasy and Adventism that I know we've all thought about that it comes in a variety of ways, personally. I believe there's, a, there's an apostasy in this branch of Adventism, that branch, that branch, that, is, that qualifies as the Alpha and Omega. But when it comes to prophetic understanding, I personally believe this isn't, this isn't a test question for anyone, but I'm just throwing this out there, and that's what we were doing casually last night. The Alpha of prophetic error in Adventism is the daily. Pioneers understood that the daily was paganism, a satanic power. In Conradi's view, in the early part of the last century, was that the daily represented Christ's work in the heavenly sanctuary, a godly power. So the daily, the alpha of prophetic error in Adventism, is that the power of Satan, we should call it the power of Christ. And uh, so, for me, what I was saying last night is that I believe the omega of prophetic error, and I'm not talking about the, the, the big omega, I'm just saying the omega of prophetic error in Adventism is the glorious land, in verse 41 of Daniel 11. Because the glorious land, in verse 41 of Daniel 11, is the United States of America, a satanic power. It's the power that forces the whole world to worship the beast and his image. You know, Islam isn't that far off when it says the United States is the great Satan. That's the role it plays at the end. It speaks as a dragon. That's the glorious land of verse 41. But what is the counter-argument to what it is? No, it's not the United States. It's the Seventh-day Adventist Church, a godly power. So here at the end, in the book of Daniel, we have an argument once, over, once again over a very important symbol, symbol. And the pioneers said paganism was a satanic power, and the argument from Europe was is it's a godly power. <laughs> Say from Europe, because Conradi was from... Germany, and we have some German friends here with us. At the end of the world, the argument is over the glorious land, which is the United States' satanic power, and the argument against it is that, no, it's the Seventh-day Adventist Church, a godly power. So the brother came up, and he reminded me that uh, Sister White says the daily isn't a test question, and I agreed, but I, but I told him this. When, when Sister White wrote in her day and age, Uh, that we shouldn't be buying bicycles, um, that it was a sin. In in that time period, if you go back and look, it was taking one or two months' wages to buy a bicycle. 
and there were these ones in, with these big tires, and they were all, you, know, you were just out to look cool was all you were doing, and she said so. It was just for fashion. There was no purpose except to be out showing your neighbors that you had a bicycle, and she said that was a sin. But how many missionaries are doing work around the world today on bicycles? And how cheap are they today? It's, it's different. When it comes to inspiration, time and circumstances need to be considered. Now, I don't, I'm not trying to erase what Sister White says about the daily. I, I'm really not trying to do that. But the pioneers were right about the daily, and it was important. In fact, when you look closely at what the pioneers said about the daily, if you take the wrong position, you do destroy the 2300-day prophecy. I hope to show that to you. You do sweep it away with the wrong position. And some of the pioneers knew that. Wagner knew that. Wagner says, if you take the position uh, that Ellen White is supporting in early writings, page 74. Uh, anyway, we'll get to that. I'm getting way off track. Um, so what I'm saying is, is that yes, I know the, the quotes where Sister White's saying that the daily is not a, a test question, and I'm not saying it's a test question, but I am saying this. When Sister White was saying that in the early part of the last century, um, and the argument was going on, it was different. Why was it different? Because of this quote, this quote here. It says, we have no time to lose, and if you turn to verse 30 and 36, she quotes verses 30 to 36, and uh, I don't have it on the screen, but when we get there, we can read it together. We have no time to lose. Troublous times are before us. The world is stirred with the spirit of war. Soon the scenes of trouble spoken of in the prophecies will take place. The prophecy in the 11th of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. Let's stop there for a minute. Brothers and sisters, go to the pioneer writings. This is how, Pi how Ellen White understood it. The first 39 verses of Daniel 11 were fulfilled before Ellen White was alive. That's how she understood it. In fact, we just read a quote where she taught that the very first part of verse 40 was fulfilled before she was alive because she says the time of the end is 1798. So the first part of verse 40 and prior to that in Daniel 11 is past history to Ellen White. Follow me? Okay. So... When Sister White's talking about the future fulfillment of Daniel 11, what verses is she speaking about? Verses 40 onward. Okay, that's the context this is in. She says, the prophecy in the 11th of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. Much of the history that's taken place in fulfillment of this prophecy will be repeated. In fulfillment of what prophecy? Daniel 11. Brothers and sisters, there is history in Daniel 11 that will be repeated as Daniel 11 is fulfilled. That's what she said. Is that not what she says? Is that how you understand it? That's what she says. Then she continues on. In the 30th verse, a power is spoken of that, and then she quotes Daniel 11, verses 30 to 36. And as soon as she's done with verse 36, and... I don't want to go there. It's worth looking at sometime. But uh, as soon as she quotes verse 36, she says, Scenes similar to those described in these words will take place. Verses 30 to 30, she says there's history in Daniel 11 that will be repeated when Daniel 11 is fulfilled. But she says, I really want you to understand that the history of verses 30 to 36, it will be repeated. Scenes similar to those described in these words will take place. And what do these words say? Let's look at verse 31, it, it, just at verse 31. An arm shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily. Part of the history that Sister White says will be repeated is the history of the daily. And here we are at the end of the world, unlike the early part of the last century, and unlike the pioneer time period, we're at the end of the world when the final verses of Daniel 11 are about to be fulfilled, and inspiration says the history of the daily is included in that history that will be repeated. So I submit to you that time and circumstances is teaching that the daily has more significance now prophetically than it ever has had before. It's a different time. Now, I'm not saying it's a test question. I'm not saying that, but it's a different time. And uh, we need to understand what it is. 
Verse 30, this is where Sister White stop, starts. For the ships of Chittim shall come against him, therefore he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So shall he do, he shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. Normally at this point in the discussion I ask, who's prepared to give a Bible study on this verse to a non-Adventist? If I do it here, I'll get a lot of hands. It won't have the same effect. Normally you don't get any hands. I know there are some people in here prepared to give a, a presentation on verse 30, but unfortunately that is not the case in Adventism. Usually, we're not prepared to, give, to do that verse. Let's look at what Uriah Smith has to say. The prophetic narrative of verse 30 still has reference to the power which has been the subject of the prophecy from the 16th verse, namely Rome. From verse 16 in Daniel 11, the subject is pagan Rome. What were the ships of Chittim that came against this power, and when was this movement made? What country of power is meant by Chittim? The mind is carried by the testimony of Jerome to a definite celebrated city situated in that land. That is Carthage. Was ever a naval warfare with Carthage as a base of operations waged against the Roman Empire? We have but to think of the terrible onslaught of the Vandals. Who are the Vandals? Who are the Vandals? Don't read. Who are they? One of the tribes? Who are they? This is a prophecy school, not a history class. Second trumpet. Second trumpet. Okay, second trumpet. That's the answer. I mean, there's many good answers, but that's the one I was looking for. I'm sorry. Was ever a naval warfare with Carthage as a base of operation waged against the Roman Empire? We have but to think of the terrible onslaught of the Vandals upon Rome under the fierce Genseric to answer readily in the affirmative. So, what are we saying? We're saying that verse 30 is in the time period when pagan Rome has been take, beginning to be taken apart by the trumpet powers. The first four trumpet powers did what? What did they do? They brought to an end Western Rome. They brought to an end Western Rome. What did the next two trumpets, which were called woes, bring to an end? Eastern Rome. So we're, we're halfway through with the Vandals, the taking apart of Western Rome, in verse 30. He shall be grieved in return. This is still Uriah Smith. This may have reverence to the desperate efforts which were made to dispossess Genseric of the sovereignty of the seas, the first by Margarian, the second by Leo, both of which proved to be utter failure, failures. And Rome was obliged to submit to the humiliation of seeing its provinces ravaged and the eternal city pillaged by the enemy. Indignation against the Holy Covenant. We're still in verse 30. That is the Holy Scriptures, the Book of the Covenant. A revolution of this nature was accomplished in Rome. The Heruli, Goths, and Vandals who conquered Rome embraced the Arian faith and became the enemies of the Catholic Church. It was especially for the purpose of exterminating this heresy that Justinian decreed the Pope of the head of the church and the corrector of heretics. The Bible soon came to be regarded as a dangerous book that should not be read by the common people, but all questions in dispute were to be submitted to the Pope. Thus was indignity heaped upon the word, God's word. And the emperors of Rome, the Eastern Division of which still continued, had intelligence or connived with the Church of Rome, which had forsaken the Holy Covenant and constituted the great apostasy for the purpose of putting down heresy. The man of sin was raised to this presumptuous throne by the defeat of the Arian Goths, who, who then held possession of Rome in A.D. 538. Okay, let's see what this says. Maybe this can... Verse 30, pagan Rome is being addressed. This, time period after three th this is the time period after 330 when the trumpet powers of Revelation 8 are attacking the Roman Empire. Then the Bible is attacked uh, due to a religious argument going on in the kingdom. And the papacy is the power that had forsaken the Holy Covenant. That's how the pioneers understood verse 30. You see those points? Those are the points Uriah Smith just made. Um... 538, three horns removed, and the power that would place the papacy. Who's the power that would place the papacy? Pagan Rome had intelligence with them that forsook the Holy Covenant. What's the point here? The point here is this, brothers and sisters, mark this in your Bible if you haven't ever noticed this. In verse 30, pagan Rome comes into the narrative of Daniel 11 
in verse 16. He ac it, it, they actually come in in verse 14. And Uriah Smith knows this. Go back to verse 14. He was talking about when they begin to move to conquer the world. But Uriah Smith agrees also that in verse 14, the last part of verse 14, it says, And in those times there shall many stand up against the king of the south. Also the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fall. And Uriah Smith, the pioneers, the robbers of the people, that's pagan Rome, the power that was to exalt itself, the power that was destined to prophetically fall. But they begin to move to conquer the world, to conquer those three horns that were, not three horns, those three geographical areas that were in their way, way the east, the south, and the pleasant land, Syria, Egypt, and Palestine, Daniel 8, 9. They began that work in Daniel 11 in verse 16. And once they had conquered those three powers, uh, began to rule the world for 360 years in verse 40. By the time we're coming down to verse 30, they've already moved the capital of the empire from Rome to Constantinople, the trumpet powers of Revelation 8 are beginning to take them apart piece by piece. And in verse 30, the final thing they do is they have intelligence with them who have forsaken the Holy Covenant. They start to communicate with the Church of Rome. And from this point on, the subject in Daniel 11 is no longer pagan Rome. Important point in this flow of verses. Verse 31, pagan Rome's going to be doing some things in verse 31, but the subject of verse 31 is the papacy. It switched as soon as pagan Rome had intelligence with papal Rome. Papal Rome had taken the supremacy. Have you ever seen a time period in our lifetime when a power had intelligence with pagan Rome and pagan Rome took the ascendancy? Ronald Reagan had intelligence with them that forsook the Holy Covenant. And from that point on, the woman was riding that beast, directing that head. But that's outside the scope of this study. Verse 31. An arm shall stand on his part. Whose part? The papal part, brothers and sisters. This is the papal part here. It's switched. Now it's the papacy, and it's saying... Arms, military strength are going to stand up for the papacy. And the subject of verse 31, if you're going to walk through it clearly, is the arms. The arms in the relationship, in the transition, in the changeover between pagan and papal Rome. Pagan Rome gave three things to the papacy. Revelation 13, 2. It gave its power, its seat, and its authority. It gave its seat of power, the city of Rome, to the papacy in the year 330. It gave its civil authority to the papacy in the year 533 when Justinian decreed the Pope of Rome, the head of the churches, the corrector of heretics, but it gave its power to Rome in the year 496 when Clovis converted to Catholicism, changed the profession of his legal religion from paganism to Catholicism, and dedicated its army to placing the papacy on the throne of the earth. He was the first of the seven kings to do so. And one by one they fell, and the last to fall was 508. This is the history that the pioneers dwelt on all the time concerning the changeover from pagan to papal Rome. And when we get to verse 31, when it says, an arm shall stand on its part, it's simply talking about the military power that comes to the aid of the papacy to place it upon the throne of the earth. But the arms is pagan Rome, and the arms is the subject of verse 31. Notice what verse 31 says. An arm shall stand on its part, and they, who's they? The arms. And they, the arms, pagan Rome, shall pollute the sanctuary of strength. This word sanctuary, in the Bible, it can be God's sanctuary, but it can also be a pagan sanctuary. I'd submit to you the pioneers understood this to be the sanctuary of strength, the city of Rome that was polluted during the warfare during that time. But we're going to look at that further. And shall take away. This word translated take away means to remove. They would take away the daily. The pioneers understood the daily to be paganism. They were going to remove paganism in a variety of ways. And they shall place these arms, pagan Rome, the abomination that make it desolate. So, Pagan Rome's military, still looking at this verse, Pagan Rome's military might is here identified as the word arms. 
Arms, that is pagan Rome, stands on the part of the papacy. Arms pollute the sanctuary stream. Arms take away the daily. Arms place the abomination that maketh desolate. In this verse, arms, pagan Rome, does four things. Still, Uriah Smith, the power of the empire was committed to carrying out the work before mentioned, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, or Rome. This is the pioneer position. The sanctuary of strength for pagan Rome was the city of Rome. Does that make sense in your mind? Because pagan Rome was going to rule the world supremely for how long? For 360 years. When did she start to rule? 31 B.C. When did she end ruling? 330. And when she moved the capital from the city of Rome to Constantinople, what happened? Everything fell apart. It, that had been her sanctuary of strength. And as soon as she left her sanctuary of strength, here come the trumpet powers taking her apart. It was her sanctuary of strength. And that's how the pioneers understood it. And he continues on. If this applies to the barbarians, it was literally fulfilled. If if this polluting the sanctuary of strength, he's saying, applies to the Hiroli, the Vandals, and the Goths that came to the city of Rome and decimated it, he's saying that that could be one understanding. Then that fulfills this verse. For Rome was sacked by the Goths and the Vandals, and the imperial power of the West ceased through the conquest of Rome by Odeaser. Or if it refers to those rulers of the empire who are working in behalf of the papacy against the pagan and all other opposing religions, it would signify the removal of the seat of the empire from Rome to Constantinople, which contributed its measure of influence to the downfall of Rome. This passage would then be parallel to Daniel 8.11 and Revelation 13.2. Please notice that the pioneers, when they're dealing with the downfall of pagan Rome and the rise of papal Rome, they're connecting it with verses all over the books of Daniel and Revelation. That's what the story of prophecy is about. It's the story of these changing empires that are opposing God and his people. How, this is still Uriah Smith. How was the daily or paganism taken away? As we approach the year 508, we behold a grand crisis ripening between Catholicism and the pagan influence still existing in the empire. Up to the time of the conversion of Clovis, king of France, 496, the French and other nations of Western Rome were pagan, but subsequent to that event, the efforts to convert idolaters to Romanism were crowned with great success. The conversion of Clovis is said to have been occasion of bestowing upon the French monarchs the titles of most Christian majesty and the eldest son of the church. Brothers and sisters, wait, there was a time when, when I had one day in London and uh, Russell and I went to a library. We were looking for... Uh, old uh, historical records from old London newspapers about 1840. We were trying to get some really good information on the fall of the Ottoman Empire. And you go back into that history and, and you're reading through it looking for stuff and you find, I found, I see all through those papers and we, we read for several months there, the actions that the country of France has been playing for the last five years uh, since the Iraq crisis is the same attitude France was having way back there in the 1840s about the Ottoman crisis. And you know what? You know what? The, the, the reason that France handles its way, the, the way it does in world politics today, in my understanding, is because it was the first of the seven European kings to bow to Rome. They know it. It's the eldest daughter of the church. If there's any of the European countries that are doing the bidding of Rome, it's France. It's France. Between that time and 508, by alliances, capitulation, and conquest, the Aberisi, the Roman garrisons, and by the way, I don't mean to offend any of my European brethren. The country of greatest darkness in this time period is going to be the United States, okay? Let's be clear about that. The, by alliances, capitulations, and conquest, the Aberisi and the Roman garrisons in the West, Brittany, the Burgundians, and the Visigoths were brought into subjection from the time when these successes were fully accomplished, namely 508. 508, they were accomplished. The papacy was triumphant so far as paganism was concerned, for though the latter doubtless retarded the progress of the Catholic faith, yet it had not the power of had the disposition to suppress the faith and hinder the encroachments of the Roman pontiff. This describes what we've already dealt with. This is the Goths um, fleeing the city of Rome in March of 508. Verse 31 is saying that pagan Rome's army were going to stand up for the papacy. They were going to pollute 
the city of Rome, the sanctuary of strength, whether it was the destruction that took place from the trumpet powers or the removal of the capital, the city of Rome was cast down, which is mentioned in another place. And in verse 31, paganism was removed in a variety of ways, and by 508 it was gone, and then the papacy was placed. And then in the following verses, we see the exaltation and the persecution that takes place when the papacy rules the world for 1260 years. So why is that significant? Back to the original quote. Scenes similar to those described in these words will take place. What are these scenes? It's saying that arms are going to come to the aid of the papal power. Have you seen any arms come to the aid of the papal power? The arms that uh, Bible prophecy said would come to the aid of the papal power are active in the world today. This is a history that's being um, played out before our very eyes. Um, it's the transition from pagan to papal Rome, the removal of the religious profession by the power which supplies the military strength to the papacy. Uh, it's the removal of the three geographical obstacles. What three geographical obstacles? The three horns. This history is covering the time period when the, the Hurali, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals had to be removed. Part of the history that Sister White says, seen similar to those described in these words, is the history of the conquering of three geographical areas. Brothers and sisters, upon the testimony of two, a thing will be established. You've you got verses in the Bible that says, upon the testimony of two or three, and some of them say, upon the testimony of two. We've read one. You may not remember it. It's in Genesis. The thing was doubled unto Pharaoh to establish the vision. If you see something in the Bible two times, it's established. And in the book of Daniel, we have the story of two Romes. We have pagan Rome and papal Rome. Pagan Rome and papal Rome. Both of their leaders were called what? Pontifus Maximus. Both of them had a time prophecy. Both of their time prophecies were directly related to the city of Rome. Both were persecuting powers. Both stood up against Christ. And both started their time prophecies when? When the third geographical area was overcome. With pagan Rome, it was Syria to the east, Palestine, and Egypt to the south. With papal Rome, it was the Hurali, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals. Upon the testimony of two, a thing shall be established. I submit to you that when modern Rome, which has been illustrated on the two testimonies of pagan and papal Rome, when modern Rome returns to rule the world, it will first have to overcome three geographical areas. Why? Because we have two testimonies about Rome that say that's how they start to rule. And sure enough, in this history that includes the history of pagan Rome and papal Rome going through this transition, there was three geographical areas, the Hurali, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals included in this history. And what did Sister White say? Scenes similar to those described in these words will take place. Now, are there three geographical areas in verses 40 to 45 that we see the king of the north conquering? Yeah. Well, I don't know. I don't know if there is or not because it's Bible symbolism. We have the king of the south, we have the glorious land, and we have Egypt. Some will tell you the king of the south may be the Soviet Union. Geographical area, okay, I can buy that. But some would say that the glorious land isn't a geographical area. They'll say that it's the Seventh-day Adventist church, a spiritual entity, and brothers and sisters, I'll, what I'm saying is the prophetic testimony says it must be a geographical area. And one of the champions of teaching that the glorious land in verse 41 is the Seventh-day Adventist church, you know what one of his arguments are? Is that you can't have um, a power in Bible prophecy symbolized. If it's symbolized, then it, you've got to look for something symbolic. I hope I'm expressing it, but that's what he means. And you know what the answer to that is? Revelation 13, 11. I want this on the record um, for that brother and those that accept this reasoning. Revelation 13, 11. This, he's talking about 
the rule that has been made famous uh, by Louis Weir about before the cross is literal, after the cross is spiritual, and he's saying here we're after the cross. We can't be identifying a literal power with a symbol. In verse 41, this glorious land is a symbol that can't be a literal power. In verse 11 of Revelation 13, it says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Is this symbolic? Yes. Is it a literal power? Yes. What power is it? Yes. Ah, so it's not too far out of line to say the glorious land may very well indeed be the United States, right? Just being expressed under another symbol. Brothers and sisters, there's three geographical areas in, in verses 40, 41, and 42 and 43. I take 42 and 43 together. They're both dealing with Egypt. In terms of the three geographical areas, the Soviet Union, 1989, the king of the south, the king of atheism. It began with atheistic France. When it came down, it was the atheistic Soviet Union. The United States is next. Sister Wright says, after the United States passes a Sunday law, then every country on the globe will follow our example. And Egypt is next. And it symbolizes all the countries of the world three geographical areas in agreement with the two testimonies of Rome in pagan and papal Rome. And brothers and sisters, upon the testimony of two or three, a thing shall be established. And this also, this truth, when you see this truth, and this is truth, when you see this truth, what else is it teaching? It's teaching this, that it wasn't until the third geographical area was conquered for pagan Rome in 31 BC that it began to rule supremely. And it wasn't until the third horn was removed for the papacy that it began to rule supremely. So let me ask you this, when is the deadly wound healed for the papacy? When it conquers the third geographical area, it begins to rule supremely. Egypt falls first. The deadly wound was not healed in 1929 at the Lateran Treaty based on Bible prophecy. Although it, that was a big step. I'm not arguing that. It was a big step. What else takes place in those verses? After the papacy established, after the third geographical obstacle is conquered, scenes similar to those described in these words will take place. Then we're into verses 32 and 36. Persecution and self-exaltation, and sure enough, that's what verse 44 and 45 are all about. The tidings out of the east and the, out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly make away many. Persecution. Persecution over what? Persecution over what? <laughs> over a message. The third angel's message is symbolized in east and north. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. And he shall come to his end. And none shall help. The power that in Bible prophecy um, changes <laughs> is the United States. Of, of all of these three powers, these three powers are the focus of Bible prophecy. The beast, the dragon, the false prophet. We've already looked at some aspects of the beast, dragon, and the false prophet. We've seen them symbolized in the cross, Ellen White, Numbers 22, Nehemiah. But these three powers each have their own characteristics in Bible prophecy. And the power in Bible prophecy of the United States is the power that changes. It begins speaking, it begins as a lamb, ends up speaking as a dragon. There's a transition that goes on, a transformation. It begins with two horns of strength. What are the two horns of strength of the United States when it begins? Re Protestantism and republicanism. When the United States is speaking as a dragon, can it possibly be upholding Protestantism and republicanism? It can't. It's a, de it's a denial of that. What are the two horns of strength for the United States at the end of the world? Military, Military and economic strength. Um, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon, and he exercised all the power of the first beast before him, and he causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he had two horns like a lamb. And here we see where Sister White is telling us those two horns of strength are republicanism and Protestantism. 
The lamb-like horns and dragon voice of the symbol point to a striking contradiction between the professions and the practice of the nation thus represented. The speaking of the nation is the action of its legislative and judicial branches dropping down and this, to the last sentence. And the statement that the first beast with two horns causeth the earth and them to dwell in therein to worship the first beast indicates the authority of this nation is to be exercised in enforcing some observance which shall be an act of homage to the papacy. Verses 15, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and his cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed, military strength, and he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand and in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell economic save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Should be killed, military strength, no man buys or sells economic strength. The power that supplied the military strength back here in verse um, 31 that stood on the part of the papacy in this history that would be repeated was pagan Rome. Pagan Rome is pointing forward to the role of the United States. And in the history of pagan Rome coming to the aid of the papacy, we have the history of 496 to 508 when the seven European kings changed their profession from a profession of paganism to the profession of Catholicism as their legal religion. In the Reagan years, brothers and sisters, the identical thing happened. Paganism before the time of Clovis was the worst persecutor against Catholicism, it opposed Catholicism, but it changed its religious profession. In our lifetime, the, the standard against Catholicism was Protestant America. But in the Reagan years, we formed a secret alliance here in the United States with the Vatican. Only one definition for Protestant in any dictionary, and that's to protest Rome. And you can't protest Rome if you're in an alliance with her. So sure enough, we have a history fulfilling where we see the United States walking through verse 31 doing the same things. It's supplying the military strength. It's changing its profession. And what's it doing it for? To remove the three obstacles, the king of the south, the glorious land, and Egypt. And in verse 40, the image of the beast begins in the United States when the United States enters in to having intelligence with the papacy. When they, when they decide, when Ronald Reagan decided to have secret, a secret alliance with the Vatican, and we're gonna get to that point and have a, our one video clip, you'll see it was a secret alliance that he entered into. He was doing the identical thing that verse 30 is talking about. He was in, having intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant, and the next thing that happened is he was supplying military strength. Arm stood on his point, stood on his part, and then the work of removing the three horns took place. So, there, here is the, the three geographical areas of Daniel 8, verse 9. Uh, you also find these three geographical areas of pagan Rome, how pagan Rome took control of the world in Daniel 11, verses 16 and 17. It's the same history of, as Daniel 8, verse 9. Daniel 11, verse 16 and 17 is describing the conquering of Syria, Palestine, and Egypt. In verse 9 of Daniel 8, that's the south, the east, the pleasant land. Here's two Romes. Both were persecuting powers. Both called their ruler Pontifus Maximus. Both were pagans. Both trampled down God's people in the sanctuary. Both exalted themselves to God. Both had time prophecies. Both time prophecies were connected to the city of Rome. Both time prophecies began when a third geographical area was conquered. Both pagan and papal Rome prefigured prefigure modern Rome upon the testimony of two, a thing shall be established. Modern Rome's three geographical obstacles, the king of the south, verse 40, the glorious land, verse 41, Egypt, verses 42 and 43. When the, based on the first two Romes, based upon the first two testimonies, the two witnesses, when the third geographical obstacle is overcome, Rome rules supremely. When the third obstacle is overcome, the deadly wound is healed. Based upon the rule of 
First and last, brothers and sisters, the story of Daniel 11:40 and onward is the story of the deadly wound. The very first action in verse 40, and at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, is describing, if someone would ask you, where is it in Bible prophecy that you can point to where the deadly wound is delivered? You Adventists always talk about the deadly wound. What verse do you point to to show the history, the prophetic history where the deadly wound is delivered? That's verse 40 of Daniel 11. We don't really recognize it in Adventism, but that's the verse that says, here is where the deadly wound is delivered. And it begins to tell the story of the deadly wound, and the next three verses, up to verse 43, they tell the story of how the deadly wound is healed. And brothers and sisters, the story begins with the deadly wound, and it ends with the deadly wound being healed. That's, that's the way the Lord tells his story. The first, the last, the beginning and the end. John and Daniel agree, the deadly wound is healed. You can see references there. Uh, ah, okay, here's where we're going with this. After the deadly wound is healed. This is the kind of point theologians like, okay? This is a, a, a technical, structural point. The story in verses 40 to 43 is the, the story of the deadly wound. It begins when the deadly wound is delivered, but based upon the testimonies of pagan and papal Rome, before Rome rules supremely again, three geographical areas will need to be overcome. The third one is overcome with Egypt. Therefore, in verse 43, Egypt is conquered and Rome returns to power. Then you see the message from the east and the north. The, the structure of this message is, is that first we see Rome returned to power, and then we see a message. Then the message is introduced. And the message of verse 44 that comes out of the east and the north, we'll spend time there later, but it's the message of the three angels' message. So what I want you to see is that in Daniel 11, first the deadly wound is healed, first the papacy returns to power, and then the message of the hour is introduced. Now, when we talk about the deadly wound, where do we get that term as Seventh-day Adventists? Where does that come from? Revelation, Revelation where? 13. Revelation 13. And verses 11 and onward describe the role of how the United States returns the papacy to power. It's the same story, only it's taking the story from the point of view of what the United States, its participation in the healing of the deadly wound. And as soon as verses 11 on to the end of chapter 13 are done telling the story about how the papacies returned to rule the world, then what do we have? We have chapter 14, right? And what's chapter 14? It's the message. First, how the deadly wound is healed, and then the message. Rightly understood, we're not there yet, but rightly understood, Revelation 17 is telling the story of the healing of the deadly wound, how the papacy returns to control the world once again. That's what Revelation 17 is telling the same story as Revelation 13, as Daniel 11, how the papacy returns to power, and as soon as Revelation 17 is over, what do we have? Revelation 18, and what's Revelation 18? It's the message. That's... That's God's signature, but theologians like that. The structure of Daniel 11 is identical with the structure of Revelation 13 and 14 and Revelation 17 and 18. The books of Daniel and Revelation are the same book. And the persecution is also described in those verses. So let me summarize. We moved quickly through that one. As we move into Daniel 11, verses 40 to 45, it seemed important to me to first be able to mark our starting part point from the book of Daniel, the time of the end, 1798. You can do it from the book of Daniel alone. And as you do so, you're going to find out who the king of the south is just by understanding that the power that attacked the papacy in 1798, just go into the history books, France. So we got a starting point there just from the book of Daniel that is sound, that seemed worthwhile to address. I also want to identify that Daniel 11 is set in the context of the great controversy and it's telling the story of the very climax of the great controversy where 
human probation comes to its close. These are the events that lead to the close of probation that have been clearly revealed, but multitudes have no more understanding of these important truths than if they'd never been revealed. These are those events, and I, I like to lift up the significance of that. This is the very heart of the great controversy in terms of probation still being open. Significant verses, verses we need to understand. The, the testimony of the two Romes, the testimony of the two Romes, pagan and papal Rome, brothers and sisters, they're on the record so we can be certain about who we're dealing with with modern Rome. Upon the testimony of two or three, a thing shall be established. There is much more to say about that testimony. But one of the things that we need to agree on, and the only reason we need to agree on it is because of the, in my mind, is because of the controversy that's raging over these verses within Adventism, that there's a possibility that these three obstacles may not be three geographical areas. Maybe they're a geographical area, a spiritual entity, and then something else. We need to let the Word make us certain that we're dealing with geographical areas as we enter into this. And I also want to remind us that the ancient prophets were all speaking about the end of the world, and when it comes to the power of Babylon at the end of the world, in a singular sense, it's portrayed as a power that comes out of the north, king of kings, personating Christ, and it's associated with Babylon. Um, I've been getting a lot of questions but I haven't had any of them handed to me on paper. So if we're going to do some of that, we need to have um, questions um, written down. And uh, at this time, we'll bring this to a close with a word of prayer. <coughs> Heavenly Father, um, we thank you for bringing us to this point in our studies. We are beginning to enter into sacred ground upon the verses that you've designed for us to understand at this time. Um, the knowledge that you intend to increase that parallels the increase of knowledge in the Millerite time period. And we ask you to bless this study that this might be uh, a meeting here that would be a springboard for uh, finishing this work on planet Earth. Um, these are long days and uh, there's a lot of information being shared. We ask that you bless our, our minds, bless our thoughts, but also uh, put a conviction in our hearts that we need to test the things that we're hearing, that we, we need to uh, challenge them through your word and through prayer, and if they are uh, the truth, that we need to make them our own. Um, as we break up at this time, we ask that you continue to go with us. Um, Keep our thoughts and minds upon you as we interact with one another in, this, in our fellowship. And uh, thank you for all you've done so far along the way in this prophecy school. Prophecy school in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>